Thank you. So today we are into the third session in a series of 10 workshops on emotional intelligence based on this best-selling book by Daniel Goldman. And uh, let us do the recap as usual. And now let me start with a question, which is more important? Is it IQ or EQ? I would like to have some response. What do you think? Is it IQ or EQ that is more important? Any answers? EQ. EQ. Okay. Okay. I will not give an answer now. Let us take it up during the question and answer session. Now let's do a recap. What we have seen earlier is that the present day education system focuses mostly on intelligence quotient or IQ, but studies have shown that effective IQ in determining success in life is only about 20%. But IQ is important because I, it has a flow effect. Flow effect means more or less, uh, most people will have, will certainly need to have a threshold level of IQ in order to get into a job or to start with a business enterprise. But once they have started with it, progression or success thereafter is going to be determined almost 80% by emotional maturity. This is what practices called competency mapping has shown. So both of them are important. IQ is important to get entry into somewhere and EQ is important to take us forward thereafter. Human beings are emotional beings, but up until the second half of 20th century, science didn't have much clue as to what, uh, how emotions really work. In the second half of 20th century, there were advanced brain imaging techniques like MRI and fMRI scans that threw light on how actually emotions are triggered in the brain and how emotions influence our decisions and interactions. In the year 1995, Daniel Goldman consolidated the scientific studies into emotions and published this book, Emotional Intelligence, and that became a bestseller. And thanks to the popularity of that book, most of us have at least heard about emotional intelligence. Here in this series of workshops, what we'll do is to go through the pages of this book and try to understand emotional intelligence in a more detailed manner. In the last session, we went through the neuroanatomical structure of the brain and discussed the mechanism of amygdala hijack. And before getting into today's material, let me give out the standard caveat. I am not an expert in emotional intelligence. I am not an expert in psychology, therefore please do not take whatever that is being said in this workshop as the last word in emotional intelligence. Please try to uh, find out from other sources and try to practice some techniques and see for yourself whether it is right, whether it works or not. Now in the last session we went through the emotional brain and today we will go, we will first start with understanding the history of development of the field of emotional intelligence we will find which are the five fundamental domains of emotional intelligence and then we will take up the first domain of it that is emotional self-mastery that is in the agenda today okay first let us try to see how actually emotional intelligence as a field of study developed actually many many years ago people were really thinking as to how to measure intelligence of human beings Celebrated anthropologists in the 19th century, Paul Broker and Francis Galton thought that by measuring the size of the skull, they could determine intelligence. That means the higher the, higher the head or the bigger the head, the more intelligent the person is. And that was their concept in, in the late 1800s, that 1880, 1890 or so. But we cannot dismiss it outright as wrong because Today, the person high, uh, having the highest IQ alive is considered to be Mr. Christopher Langdon, and he is not able to wear normal helmets because he has got a, no, uh, a head that is higher than normal size. So in some cases, it, this is actually right. People with bigger heads are uh, seen to be intelligent, especially in the case of, uh, case of Mr. Christopher Langen, but in so many cases it is not right as well. The first objective questionnaire kind of IQ test, uh, the kind of thing that we are familiar about IQ test, that was developed in the year 1904 
by Alfred Binet and Theodore Simon. They were approached by the French Ministry of Education and the requirement was to find out a method by which students who were lazy could be segregated from students who were really intellectually challenged. And Binet and Simon came up with the question, objective question type of test and that is the first kind of IQ test that we are familiar about. And that was done in 1904. It was called the Binet-Simon test. So IQ test, as we know about, has a history of more than 100 years. During the First World War, this Binet-Simon test was adapted for use in the United States. And that adapted test was called Stanford-Binet test. And Stanford Binet test was used to, it was administered to 1.7 million US soldiers. And those soldiers who scored high in that Stanford Binet test were given officer training. And those who didn't score high, they were not provided with officer training. And that was the first mass adoption of IQ test. And thereafter, IQ test had a heyday. That is, even today, IQ mo uh, tests that, was, that are modeled on the lines of IQ are being widely used for admission into academic institutions and for recruitment for jobs. But glaring uh, 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 gaps in the effectiveness of IQ in determining human intelligence have been very much apparent, as we have already discussed. Recently, a very interesting result came out of the longest study ever held in adult development. This was done by Harvard University. Let us ask a question. What is the right time to determine, what is the right age to decide if a person's life was indeed a good one or not? Will it be when they are in their teenage or will it be during the middle age or will it be during their old age? What is the right time to see indeed if their life was a good one? Any there answers? No specific age time. No specific age time. No specific age time. Any other answer? I think it is always the old age that would be the right time to see if the life was indeed a good one. Because in the old age, the life story is almost complete. And we can conclude with certainty that something was really indeed good or not. On the other hand, let us take someone during the middle age or during the teenage. Imagine that they are very highly uh, powerful, rich, uh, uh, enjoying life to the fullest and all. And they end up being miserable, poor, destitute in their old age. Is it an example of a good life? Therefore, if we take the life during middle age or a teenage, we cannot draw a definite conclusion. But whereas during old age, the story is almost over, we can conclude with reasonable certainty that they have, if, if they are healthy and happy, we can reasonably say that they have indeed done something right to have their life conclude in such a good way. But what indeed will make someone to have a healthy and happy old age? How can we find out? If we go and interview the healthy and happy old people, the answers they may give may not be very reliable because memory, we cannot very much rely upon. Memory can outright be creative and memory is very much influenced by biases, prejudices and all nostalgia and so many other things. In that case, what is the way out? What if people are followed right from their youth, year after year, meticulously follow, uh, recording many of the data uh, about them, and they are followed up, up to their very old age, and then we can see if they end up being happy, we can see what they objectively, what they did right during their life, and if someone else ends up not being happy, we can find what was the things that made these happier and healthier people really different in their life. And this was indeed done by Harvard study 
in the longest ever conducted study on adult development they started it in the year 1938 they followed 724 people from their teenage all the way up to their old age so that study is now into the into its 82nd year they had 268 participants who were students from the harvard university itself that means those people were kind of well to do uh, 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 backgrounds and there were 456 students from the disadvantaged section inner city sections that means these 456 men they were not from well to do background so there was the uh, people from different backgrounds included in the study when they started none of them knew where they will end up in their life and the uh, year after year uh, meticulous details about them about their education about their iq about their blood cholesterol level about their attitude whether they are hard working uh, their income level their background the videograph of them talking with their near ones interview with their parents all of them was taken and some of them became lawyers some became bricklayers some became alcoholics some became schizophrenic some started out rich and ended up poor in the old age some started out poor in their teenage and ended up rich in the old age one ended up becoming the president of the united states and then got assassinated president john f kennedy was one of the original participants of the study they finished the study uh, they they completed 75th year of the study in the year 2013 at that time armed with all this data they tried to find out what about these people in their 50s could have would be the best predictor of their health and happiness in their 80s so they did a very good robust scientific analysis in this vast amounts of data that is tens of thousands of pages of data they analyzed and the finding was a very big eye opener for them do you have any guess as to what about people in their 50s will be the best predictor of their health and happiness in their 80s will it be their attitude towards hard work will it be their income level will it be will it be their education will it be their iq will it be their uh, you know family background what would it be any guesses here their hard work and attitude their relation the positive relations exactly the finding was just this wisdom as old as the hills the clearest message they got from the study was good relations keep people happier and healthier period it was not their income it was not their iq it was not their attitude towards hard work if they were in caring and loving relations they ended up being happier and healthier so this was the biggest finding that came out of this extensive study that was spreading over more than 75 years the fact here is that iq doesn't predict a person's ability to nurture loving and caring relations and second in our schools we are not taught how to nurture loving and caring relations another influential work challenging the supremacy of iq came from howard gardner in the year 1983 Howard Gardner published uh, presented the theory of multiple intelligences that year in a nutshell what it says is that human beings are unique each person is endowed with different kinds of intelligences and it is not the right practice it's not a fair practice therefore to judge human intelligence through the single straight jacket of iq here we have eight different geniuses in their own fields as per howard gardner's theory they are all intelligent in different kinds of intelligences like sachin tendulkar is a genius in bodily kinesthetic intelligence mahatma gandhi is a genius in interpersonal intelligence jk rowling is a genius in verbal intelligence 
and logical mathematical thinking, Albert Einstein is a genius. And likewise, thing is that we all accept there are geniuses, but if an IQ test is administered on these people, except Albert Einstein, others may not score IQ level of uh, genius level of IQ score. But there are geniuses, there is no question. Sachin Tendulkar, for example, failed in his 10th standard. That concept is represented very well in this cartoon as well. Uh, Howard Gardner, what he says is that utilizing IQ as a comprehensive measure of human intelligence is like judging the ability of all these different kinds of animals, that is monkey, penguin, uh, elephant, fish, or seal, or dog, by their ability to climb a tree. This is what Howard Gardner presented, and it's a very popular theory. In this multiple intelligences, there are two personal intelligences. One is interpersonal intelligence, and another one is intrapersonal intelligence. Political leaders are supposed to be intelligent, very intelligent in the interpersonal realm. Mahatma Gandhi, as we all know, he united 400 million people and brought down the might of the largest empire ever seen on earth through his ability to connect with the people. He had a, a very high level of interpersonal intelligence. Entrepreneurs are supposed to have high level of intrapersonal intelligence. Dhirubhai Ambani started out as a petrol station attendant and ended up building one of the largest business houses in the world. It is a dog-eat-dog -dog world in the, in the commerce business uh, field. It's a dog-eat-cutthroat competition. In that area, if somebody has to go against all odds and succeed, that person needs to have a very clear idea of his own strengths as well as weaknesses. Therefore, Entrepreneurs are supposed to have very high level of intrapersonal intelligence. Both interpersonal and intrapersonal intelligences are very much related to emotional intelligence. However, the practitioners of multiple intelligences haven't delved much deeper into the world of inner world of emotions. Rather, they have focused their attention in the cognitive aspects of intelligence like memory, reasoning, logic, perception, and all. It was around 1990, Peter Salve, who expanded interpersonal and intrapersonal intelligence into the realm of emotions and identified the five fundamental domains of emotional intelligence. That is kind of the birth of emotional intelligence. Peter Salve said that there are, there are five components as self-awareness, ability to manage emotions, self-motivation, empathy, and handling relationships as the five components of emotional intelligence. Each of these components are described very extensively in the book. We will take them one by one. And today, we will discuss the first component, that is emotional self-awareness. To understand what is emotional self-awareness, this story is very helpful. Once a fierce samurai demanded of a tiny monk to teach him heaven and hell. The monk replied, you are a fool. I can't waste my time with you. This angered the samurai, he drew out his sword and he was about to beat my monk. At that time, the monk said, this is hell. Hearing this, the samurai understood his mistake and he became repentant and he uh, knelt down in front of the monk. At that time, the monk said, this is heaven. This is the difference we, uh, the self-awareness about our emotions can make. This sam samurai, he was caught up in his emotion of anger. This is he when he was swept away by his emotion. And that same samurai, when he became aware that he was caught up in his own anger, he transformed into this. 
So this is the dramatic change emotional self-awareness can bring. So emotional self-aware means we are both aware of our mood as well as our thoughts about that mood. So far, we have discussed theory and history about emotional intelligence. Now we will get into some practical tips. There are two practical tips in order to enhance emotional intelligence. First tip is to put words into what you feel. That is to describe in words your own emotions. In order to make it even more effective, if we can name, if we can assign or call our own emotions with a name, that will enhance our emotional awareness much greater. And the second tip is to be a second person observer of our own emotions. These two we will discuss in more detail. The first is about assigning a name to our own emotions. Before doing it, let us try to understand what is the importance of describing something by its name. Let's do a quick exercise. Dityam Manavsinaya, will you be able to speak if I answer, ask you a question? Dityam Manavsinaya is driving, so I will spare him that. I will instead direct that question to Dityam uh, uh, Shivadas. Dityam Shivadas, will you be ready to answer a question in 30 seconds time? Yes, Harish. Yes, okay. Vijayan Shivadas, the task here is like this. Imagine that you are being approached by a person who is not at all in Toastmasters, but he has heard about Periyar Toastmasters. He is very much interested to join Periyar Toastmasters. He very badly wants to reach out to the president of Periyar Toastmasters, and he comes to you, but there is a condition upon you. He will ask you a question, but there is a condition on you. The condition is that, in your answer, you should not utilize the name Sabocletus. Okay? With yes. that condition, imagine that person is asking you this question. Who is the president of Periyar Toastmasters Club? What will you, what will be your answer? Please give it in 30 seconds. Yes, Mr. Harish. I will tell him in the person, he is working in AYT before last 12 to 13 years. And he, we are sharing our room together last three years. He is a well-known person in uh, Jubail. He is a singer also. These are the description about Periyar President as far as someone is asking to me. Okay. Thank you, DTM. Shivadas, that was a very beautiful, interesting answer. Now, let me put the same question to another person who is not in uh, Toastmasters, but there is no condition. Madam uh, Divya, ma'am, are you ready to answer this question? Yes. 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 Madam Divya, the question to you is the same, but there is no condition on it. You are free to answer it the way you like. So the question is, who is the president of Periyar Toastmasters Club? Mr. Sabo Cletus. Okay. Dear audience, we have seen two answers for the same question. Now, for the questioner, for that person who is a guest who wants to join Periyar Toastmasters, which of these two answers will be understandable and useful? Second one. <laughs> Very much. Actually, second, second one. Second one. Because when we are able to assign a name to something, that suddenly makes that object something far more structured and clear in our mind. This property of name we can utilize in enhancing our emotional self awareness. I have an experience because married men, as well as parents of teenage children, know how emotional people can be. My daughter is in the 12th, was in the 12th grade last year and she had to take a lot of IQ kind of test in order to get admission into engineering colleges. And obviously she was frustrated one day. She was so bloody frustrated that she was literally profusely crying when I called her. And she was so upset and angry. She was complaining about her mom. She was complaining about her brother. That was something that she's so fond of her little brother, but that day she told me, my brother, he's an annoyance, he's an irritation, he's a nuisance, he doesn't do anything right. I, he's, she was so angry and so upset about it. And I had just recently finished reading this particular chapter in the book, so I tried to make use of that new knowledge in 
knowledge about emotional intelligence. So I asked, I told her, my dear girl, this is all because of your frustration on taking these difficult exams. Had you been not so frustrated, you would have actually given your sweet little brother a kiss. When I said that, the change on her face was really cute. That crying face transformed into a cute face with a sweet smile. So when it was uh, her emotions was described in words to her, making use of the name of that particular emotion, she was able to get a grip on that emotion much better. So this is the first tip in emotional self-mastery. If you want to get rid of some unwanted emotion, some unpleasant emotion like sadness, anxiety, fear, or stage fright, particularly for Toastmasters, stage fright will be a very common unwanted emotion. If you want to get rid of it, first of all, aside that uh, emotion, what you're feeling, a name. Now somebody might have a question, what if I don't know the exact name of the emotion that I'm feeling? Don't worry. You are the only and only person in the whole universe who is experiencing that emotion. Nobody else can judge whether the name you have given before your own emotion is right or wrong. So put whichever name you would like to call your emotion. That is it. Just give a name to your emotion. So that was the first tip. And as soon as we give, we call our emotion with a name, that will by itself create a distance between ourselves and our own emotions. It will help us view our own emotion as something distinct from ourselves. That will come in handy in the second tip. That is to be a neutral observer. There was a beautiful speech by Darren Tay in the year 2016 in the World Championship Finals in Toastmasters. He came on stage, and that speech, in fact, made him the world champion that year. He came on stage and wore an unwanted underwear on top of his pants. This unwanted underwear actually represented the unwanted thoughts that he wanted to get rid of. And there he demonstrated an effective technique as to how to get rid of this kind of unwanted feelings, thoughts, and emotions. The first step was to step out of it. In our cases, let, uh, let, us assume, uh, let us imagine there is somebody who wants to get rid of stage fright. Getting rid of that unwanted stage fright, the first step is to step out of it. That can be achieved first by naming that emotion, in this case, a stage fright. And secondly, take some object like this, something that can be easily dropped on the floor, take some inanimate object and imagine that this is that emotion you want to get rid of. Like in this particular case, imagine that this is the stage fright we want to get rid of. What Darren Tay says is that the, uh, the trick to get rid of such unwanted emotions or thoughts is to first acknowledge their presence. Do not fight with them, do not deny them, do not run away from them. Just acknowledge, first acknowledge their presence, then step out of it, and third, neutrally observe it. So imagine this is the stage fright that we want to get rid of, then just observe it. This is the stage fright. Just observe, do not argue with it, do not deny it, do not run away from it, just simply observe. As we observe, we will experience that emotion getting weaker. And as it weakens, just discard it. Just discard, that's it. This is an effective technique. As I said earlier, I am not an expert in emotional intelligence, I am not an expert in uh, psychology, so I don't know whether it will work for everyone, but I have practiced it and I have seen it working. Just see for yourself. That's all I can say now. With that, we have come to the end of today's material. And the next session, we will get into 
the next two fundamental domains that is how to rein in emotional impulses and self motivation and now it is time for question and answers